I'm Jasmine Moradi, and you're listening to the Queens of Tech podcast, a podcast series about raising the voice of workplace champions. 60 plus questions in around 30 to 40 minutes with women of color, non binary, and transgender influencers about their journey into STEM science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I started the Queens of Tech podcast initiative in May 2022 because I would like to retain more women of color, non-binary, and transgenders in the tech industry. Talent is out there, but our work environment needs to improve for all to feel safer, stay authentic, and to be valued for our contributions. My vision is to raise the workplace ecosystem for all in tech, by killing the imposter syndrome, stopping bad behavior, and increasing equity opportunities. Each podcast talk is built around 60 plus questions regarding upbringing, education, career path, DIB, and future advice. My mission is to bridge a gap between schools and workplaces by getting into the heart of my guest's personal life and career journey to inspire other girls, women of color, non-binary, and transgenders to unleash the full potential to reach top leadership roles in the tech industry. My goal is to raise the voices of tech champions around the world and together with companies, investors, and politicians, raise the challenges and opportunities around equity, inclusive, diversity, and belonging in our workplaces. Enough is enough. I would like to enforce companies to build a sustainable, inclusive culture to retain diverse talent so we keep the workforce power equity to continue building future diverse and inclusive products. Representation matters. Your voice matters. In this episode, I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Tech Queen Nikki Bath, Senior Technical Cloud Learning and Development Program Manager and Career Strategist. Hello, Nikki. Hello, so happy to be here. I'm very happy to have you joining us. How are you today? I am great. It is October. It is fall. All is well. You dress in a beautiful yellow color, which goes very well with the beautiful fall. So now let us get to know you a little bit better by diving into your journey into STEM. Hope you're ready for the Queens of Tech 60 plus questions. That's a lot of questions, but let's get to it. So let's warm up with a few fun facts about you. How would you describe your personality in three hashtags? Hashtag extrovert, hashtag friends with everybody, and hashtag social butterfly. How would you summarize your life in three sentences? If I had to summarize my life in three sentences, it would be Things are always changing. We continue to move forward. It's always unexpected. What kind of music stimulates and motivates you the most? I am an R&B early, so I love all things rhythm and blues. What is your personal motto? People who know me have heard me say it a lot. It is shoot for Pluto and you won't be disappointed if you land among the stars. What is your favorite book? Currently, my favorite book is Uglies. The show came out and I wanted to reread them all because I read them in childhood. What is your favorite podcast? My favorite podcast is actually called Black Millennial Marriage. And I subscribe to their Patreon and listen to them every week faithfully. Mac or PC? Mac, all the way. Say something interesting about you that most people don't know. Unless you've met me in person, you would not know that I'm six foot two. What is your hidden talent? I don't even think I have a hidden talent. Poetry. I haven't written in a while, but I'd say spoken word poetry. And Nikki, if you were to write a book about your life, what would a title be? It would be ABL, Always Be Learning. So much fun. Great start. Now, let us dig deeper. Our childhood has a profound effect on our attitude. Our early experiences shape our belief about ourselves, others, and the world. 
Now, let us discover your childhood. Where did you grow up and how did it shape your early experiences? I grew up in a small town called Albany, Georgia, which I've moved back to about a year and a half ago. And I had an ideal childhood. My mom was my everything. If I wanted it, she'd figure out a way to make it happen. And what was your dream job when you were a child? Funny story. My dream job was always to be a lawyer. I took law classes in middle school, high school, summer programs. And then at 16, I interned at a law firm. And uh, they were all really stressed out all the time. And I was like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. What was your favorite subject in school? Always English reading, any combination of those two. What was your least favorite subject? Math. I don't like math. I still don't like math. Thank gosh for chat, GPT, and calculators. What is your earliest memory of technology and the arrival of the internet? We had the disk for AOL. And so that is like my clearest memory, but also Napster. Like I have clear memories of it. It's not the best, but up on my screen as a kid. And which were the three first technology gadgets you owned yourself? And how did it influence your interest in tech going forward? Cassette player, because I dropped mine one day and I was determined to figure out how to make it start working. Um, it was like a Walkman. And then uh, the others would probably be an iPhone, like the really early models. So I do remember those. And I was always interested in like, how does it work? And trying to figure out how to teach my granddad how to use stuff is always like at the forefront of my mind. And during that period of time, who was your female role model growing up? And what about her inspired you? Always my mom has been my number one role model because she's the most persevering woman person that I know in the entire world. So to see her persevere and push through everything, I'm like, I can do that. So based on everything you said now about your childhood, how do you think where you grew up and the school you went to and the generation you come from influence your education and career choice? I don't know so much if the area I grew up in impacted my career choice, only because I'm in a really small town where most of the roles are not leading towards technical. We're moving more that way now. But growing up, I didn't know there was another option besides you go to school. This is what you go to school for. This is how you do it. My dad worked the same job for 44 years driving UPS trucks before he retired. So I only knew what I saw. And I was like, there has to be other things. That played a big role. Let us now dig into your career. But before that, I'm going to read two quotes. First one, how does the universe expect me to choose a career path at 16? I can't even choose what I want for dinner. Second, Abraham Lincoln said, I quote, the best way to predict your future is to create it. So Nikki, where and what did you end up studying at university? I love both of these questions because I've studied something that has nothing to do with tech. I went into college as a psychology major. I was like, I'm going to be a therapist. Then I got a D in my first psych class. And I was like, oh, I don't think I like this. But I fell in love with public speaking. I had an amazing public speaking professor. Her name was Dr. Patterson. I still remember it. And I love that class. After that first semester, I was like, I'm going to change my major. I majored in public relations for undergrad and professional communication and leadership for grad school, neither of which have to do with tech. So then who and what influenced you to get into a choice of field and industry tech? It was completely happenstance. So I knew the company I wanted to work for at the time it was Aflac. And I was like, I'm going to work there. I found a recruiter on LinkedIn. I messaged her and I was like, hey, you all have internships. I'm a grad student. Can I chat? And she was like, we don't do internships for grad students, but we do have this program. And it was a program for recent graduates. And I was supposed to be in the marketing department. And the week before the interview, she says, we have a new department called Transformation. It sits within our IT department, but it's not super technical, but it's still a tech role. Do you want to interview? I was like, I have no idea what transformation is, but I know I want to work for Aflat because it's close to me and I'd always heard great things about it. I was like, I'll do the interview. And I ended up in transformation, which is where I've been for the last 10 years. Not at Aflac, but only in the digital transformation space. That is so inspiring. Go get what you want and really follow your dreams. So you've been there for 10 years, but what professional roles have you had before that led you to the current role you have? 
for anyone who has not heard of rotational programs, you rotate through various departments. For this example, it was two years. And you learn every role within that department. You work, do the work day to day. It's a full-time salaried role. And so within that time, I worked as an analyst, data governance analyst, business process analyst, operations analyst. And I got out of the program a year and a half in to work as an operations analyst slash project coordinator. So learning how to do the budgets, doing sprint planning. I acted as a scrum master for a while. And from there, I was like, okay, I want to do something a little different and I want to move. And they had a role open, same department, but as a business analyst. So I did that for a few years and I was like, okay, well, I know what I really liked about rotating was teaching people how to do things. And so I became a technical trainer. I told my manager at the time, hey, I really want to learn more about training. She said, okay, whatever opportunities we can find in your role to allow you to do some training, let's do that. And then also in that time, I took on an adjunct role at a local college to get some experience in front of the students, in front of people talking and educating. And that is how we ended up where we are now. So what kind of role do you have today and what kind of responsibilities is included in your role? Yeah, so today I am a senior program manager specializing in technical training. So that is all things cloud, any new systems or tools that may roll out to the company, generative AI. And what that means is I make sure everyone has the skills they need. A lot of that is, okay, let's needs assessment it. Let's figure out what people need to do their jobs and start there and keep going. So the role before which is very inspiring. You knew you wanted to work for that company and you're not the recruiter on LinkedIn. How did you do to get your current role? My current role, they found me on LinkedIn. And so they were like, hey, your title matches the role that we have. Are you interested? And I was like, I never thought about leaving Aflac, but let's talk about it. Um, because I just knew I'd stay there forever and retire just because I knew it was where I wanted to end up. But I'm really happy I took the jump. I love what I'm doing. And I love seeing the impact that you make on people as their light bulb turns on and they learn new skills, especially in today's changing world. I've said before, I'm not a technical person. And one of my colleagues, who's a male, was like, you have to stop saying that. Women often downplay their experiences. You might not code, but you are a technical person. You've been in the industry for a while. And I was like, I guess you're right. So what does a typical work day or work week look like for you? Every morning I go to the gym, five days a week. But work day, after I finish, I usually respond to my international students at night or early morning my time just so I can give them an answer before they get off. Hey, Nikki, I can't log into a class. Hey, Nikki, what's being offered next month? Another typical day is scheduling classes, learning management systems. So where you go and put your classes, making sure that all the classes are in, what enrollment looks like, budgeting. I own all of our vendor contracts for training. So making sure that those are all signed, that how many people logged in this week, and then measuring like the impact of learning. Hey, we've seen a 40% increase in skills over the last 30 days and making sure that's reported up properly. I can hear your passion, Nikki. So I love the quote, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. So what would you say you love the most about your role? I really love being able to help people move into something new. So that's a combination of me being a career strategist. I ran my career coaching firm for seven years now and being able to put that into the day to day. So when you see somebody say, hey, you helped me learn how to do prom engineering. And now I do that every day and was able to get a promotion because I learned how to do it. That lights a fire every time. So what's the best experience you've had so far? Any examples you can share with us? Absolutely. So one of my colleagues thought they were going to lose their jobs, but they were able to transition and get a new job because of the courses that they had taken. So while their role was eliminated, they now had the skills to move and do something else. And what is the biggest challenge you've encountered so far in your role? And how did you end up tackling it? I found that the biggest challenge is people don't know what they don't know. So saying, hey, I need training on Google. Okay, what does that mean? So what that looked like was me sitting down with that person to find out what the next part of their job was going to be and choosing classes based off of that. It's really challenging when you don't understand what you need to learn 
because you've never used it before, especially in this day and age. And what do you wish everybody understood about your role? I wish that everybody understood that learning and development is essential to a successful company, not just from a perspective of I'm training people to do another job, but in the perspective of if you're not changing as the world changes, you will be left behind. And what is the one common myth about your professional field that you want to disapprove? I want to disapprove that project managers, program managers are not order takers. It's really important to not get into the habit of taking orders. Find out the why behind everything that's asked of you, because maybe that's not what's necessary. What do you love about working in a tech industry? I love that it's never dull. I despise, and I know people like, I like consistency. I despise consistency. I don't like when things are the same for too long. And the tech industry is the opposite of consistent. Oprah Murphy said, I quote, think like a queen. A queen is not afraid to fail. Failure is not a stepping stone to greatness. So what would you say has by far been your biggest achievement in your career? In April, I got to speak on one of the main stages at Google Conference. So that is probably one of my biggest achievements in my career thus far. And hopefully we'll continue to get on stages and talk to people and push that fire into other people. Congratulations. I would have loved to see you. You have this amazing energy. So what's the biggest factor that's helped you become successful? What are your success habits? I think it's having good mentors. I'm a huge advocate of having three kinds of mentors. Someone who you can go to with day-to-day -day questions, an executive sponsor type mentor who put your name in the rooms that you're not in, and then a mentor who has the skills that you don't have. And I've had some amazing women mentors over the last 10 years that have truly been the key to success. So how do you measure your performance at work knowing if you're successful or not? The impact I'm making on other people. So for me, it's knowing that, okay, I can see that you've done this. I can put numbers to the amount of people who are like, hey, I was able to learn how to do X, Y, Z because of what you did. Those are my ways of measuring success. And as we know, Nikki, with success comes failures. What would you say is your biggest failure or step back in your career? And what did you learn from it? At pandemic time, I was working from home with a baby. I have a May 2020 baby. And I was sending out a report and also trying to watch her because daycares were closed. And the numbers were wrong. And it went up to executive leadership. And I was like, oh, I'm getting fired. And while they were understanding, hey, you just don't touch this for right now. You still have a job. And it was actually at that moment that I was like, all right, I have to find childcare. I know daycares are closed, but we got to do something. And so ultimately it didn't tarnish my reputation or anything, but it did make me realize if I'm looking at numbers during the day, I have to be like zoned in. So what would you say is inspiring and motivating you the most in your role in career right now? Right now, what inspires me is what things are going to look like two or three months from now. Solely in the sense that it's going to be so different. And I love that thought process. And then I'm also inspired because I want other little black and brown girls to be like, I can do that. You are such a role model. Yes, you are. And you're also talking about role models. So let's jump into the influence of mentors, role models, champions, and sponsors. For our listeners, role models can consciously or subconsciously be a powerful force in our lives. In addition, champions can stand up and advocate for us and open up the world of possibilities. Sponsors match emerging talent with leaders and influential employees who can help us move ahead in our careers. Nikki, you did mention that you have mentors. How much have they meant to you? A ton. So I've had quite a few over the years just because as your seasons change, those relationships change. But I've always been an advocate of just reaching out. There's somebody that you want to be a mentor if your company does not have a formal mentorship program. So when I came to my current company, our head of learning and development, who's not here anymore, I reached out to her and was like, hey, any chance we could have an informal mentorship relationship where we chat once every month or two just so that I can learn from you why you do some of the things you do, how you got to where you are? And she was like, absolutely. 
I've had mentors where our sessions are me trying to brainstorm with them how I move to the next phase or how I do a project or how I navigate interpersonal relationships. Because, of course, there is the workplace conflict where you're trying to figure out, hey, how do I communicate this to an executive? And having another executive as a mentor can help you navigate those. And that's been critical for me. Very inspiring to hear it because history shows that it's been more common for men having mentor champ as a sponsor in business than women. So how important do you think it's to have a mentor champ and a sponsor throughout one's career? Oh, it's critical. So a few years ago, I wrote a blog post called The Criticality of Mentorship, Having a Sponsor, a Mentor, and a Champion. Because that's how important it is. All of my mentors, except for one, have actually been women. I had one male mentor who was great. He won mentor of the year that we worked together. But I don't think you can successfully navigate the corporate world without some form of mentor or sponsor. Because there's going to be rooms you're not in. Who's saying your name in those rooms that you can't get into yet? Very powerful. Let us move on to leadership. Adena Friedman, president and CEO of Nasdaq said, I quote, Empowering those around you to be heard and valued makes a difference between a leader who simply instructs and one who inspires. And Shirley Sandberg, ex-CEO of Facebook said, I quote, leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that the impact lasts in your absence. Nikki, what does leadership mean to you? I think that leadership is being able to acknowledge when you're wrong, praise those who help you get it right, and then being a face in modeling the values of yourself. And then if you're representing a company, that company as well. What distinguish a good leader versus a bad leader? If you are a leader and everyone is praising you for the work you've done and you say thank you without acknowledging that people on the ground who did the work, then you're a bad leader. And who's your favorite female, non-binary, or transgender tech leader and why? Ooh. This is a really good question. It would probably be, and I guess she just retired. So I'm going to use her anyway. The past president of AFLAC, Teresa White, would probably be my favorite because she was really in the weeds. She wanted to know exactly what was going on, how people did the thing, and also wanted to make an impact on a volunteerism spectrum as well and making sure that people understood You have to help people to be successful as well. So definitely be Teresa White. How would you describe yourself as a leader? I would use empathetic solely because I'm always like, hey, everything okay? Hey, do you want to chat about that? And as a leader, what values do you prioritize the most? I prioritize integrity, transparency, and open communication the most. And what leadership lessons have you learned that have shaped you into the leader you are today? Oh, that would probably be that you're never right all of the time. It's impossible to be right 100%. What are your three strengths and three weaknesses, Nikki? One strength is the ability to communicate with anybody. One weakness is that sometimes I definitely take things personal. Second strength would be learning quickly. If I can put my hands in it, I can do it. But that also brings forward the second weakness. I work faster than my brain thinks sometimes and can miss grammatical errors. Thank gosh for Grammarly. And then third strength would be that I can flex and switch into almost any scenario. And the weakness would be I don't say no enough. I can have a full plate and I'm so like, okay, I'll take it. But then maybe it'll end up delayed. So that's absolutely weakness. Let us now jump into the hottest topic in business today, workplace culture, unlocking of the power of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Nikki, what did diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging mean to you personally? For me, it's being able to see some form of myself in a room that I walk into that could be being a woman, being Black, being plus size, or kind of somebody along those lines Walk when I walk into a room. And what do you consider being three to five sides of good company culture if you were to join a company tomorrow? C-suite being diverse, I'm going to go to the executive page of that website and see if they all look exactly the same. I'm going to do that every single time. Two is offering benefits that are diverse. Yeah, everybody offers health insurance. Does that cover fertility benefits? Does that cover hormonal treatments? 
And I'd say third is that having some form of ERGs or employer resource groups that are unique to different people. And as a Black woman, what has been the most significant political or and cultural barrier in your career and how have you overcome these challenges? The big one for me, and I don't know if you record these for video, but if it's just audio, I have logs. When I decided that I wanted logs back in 2019, I was like, will I be able to get a job? Will I be able to grow in my career? And I went to one of my managers who was a Black woman and I was like, I really want logs. Can you tell me if you think this could hurt my career here? And she was like, no, do it. But that has been one of the big things that I really had to think about before I decided to get them. And how do you discuss about the IB challenges, such as salary gaps, promotion, or maternity leave, et cetera, with your colleagues, peers, and community? I'm going to take this one in a different thought process, not just related to race and gender, but also body types. So as a larger woman, one of my concerns is having to travel. So when traveling, I reached out to our head of travel and was like, hey, if I buy one seat on a plane, I'm going to encroach on someone else's space. And part of DEI is acknowledging the diversity also among bodies. So a company having a policy that said, hey, if you have to travel by flight, our policy allows you to get two seats or to get one first class seat. So remembering that diversity, equity, and inclusion goes beyond just race, just gender. It's body types, disabilities, et cetera, as well. There are many public and internal discussions about the barriers women, women of color, non-binary, and transgender individuals face from reaching higher position or receiving funding in the tech industry. How would you say that these issues have affected you and what advice would you give us on overcoming these roadblocks? I can't say that I've seen it affect me yet, but I'm also not in senior leadership. So while I hold a senior title and I'm a senior in my role as I'm the only learning person in my company on the tech side, I have seen many rooms that are boys clubs and women's voices aren't often heard in those rooms, especially when they're the only one. And today tech companies invest heavily in marketing, attracting women, women of color and non-binary and transgender individuals are struggling to retain them. Articles show that women are leaving the tech industry. What is your best advice or strategies for how companies can work to build a stronger corporate culture that engages the IB? I was reading about this morning. A large part of why they're losing women, especially women in their late 20s and early 30s, is due to rising childcare costs and lack of maternity leave, especially in the U.S. Offering childcare stipends Offering paid maternity leave can help. And plus her any leave too, because believe it or not, most men don't get leave either. But offering a leave that is protected, that when they come back, their job will still be there. You'll see women staying around longer. And especially offering it early. Don't make people wait 12 months to be able to get maternity or paternity leave. What would you say are the key challenges of implementing a DIB culture in a workplace and a tech industry today? I think one of the biggest costs, especially in the U.S., is politics. That sounds really bad, but when you have people who run states saying that DEIB is a waste of time or a waste of money, companies acting accordingly. We've seen a record number of DEI departments being fully laid off or companies not funding if people want to go to DEI conferences or removing whole departments. So not just listening to it at a legislative level, but tech companies acknowledging, hey, I need this to be successful. If my audience is all types of people, then my company also needs to be representative of it or else you'll have a product that is tone deaf in some way, shape or form. And why do you think it's important for more women, women of color, non-binary and transgender to join the tech industry today? Your voice, your representation is needed. We could avoid some of like the awful ads that we may see if more people were in place. Who knows? That's not okay. And how do you think companies would benefit from not just having women, women of color, not binary and transgender as leaders, but actually higher gender representation at seats with level and boardrooms with the voice? The CEO of that's like Dan Amos always used to say he knows what a white male sounds like. He doesn't just need white male present in a room. 
And that is why companies need other voices in the room. The vast of experiences, of knowledges, of understanding of things is going to come from having a diverse room. What do you think is the main reason we still see few women, women of color, non-binary and transgender leaders in tech leadership roles and as startup founders still today? Because they don't give us a chance. We will get declined faster for funding for startups. Moving up, blockers become, oh, we don't want to move Sally up because she's going to be taking maternity leave soon. We don't want to move Sally up because she has kids and she won't be able to give her full attention to it, which is not true. But that's the excuses people make, and they make them subconsciously as well. People tend to have biases, and I think that's a blocker. And some biases are truly unconscious. Um, it's one of those things where companies like we prefer people only from, especially tech companies, from Ivy League top-notch engineering programs. But when you say that and you look at the demographics of these top-notch engineering programs, that's already a bias that you put in place, not acknowledging that most of those programs don't have very many women, don't have very many non-binary or transgender people. And so now you are unconsciously biasing your hiring pool. And there's also another challenge. The data reveals concerning trend of low funding rates of startups led by women with only 1% to 2% of the funding directed towards women in the tech industry. It said that Black and Latina women in particular receive less than 1%. I'm not sure you have probably not done any funding round, but what factors do you believe contribute to this imbalance and what strategies can be activated to increasing funding for women-led startups? I go back to the unconscious. As people start to get funding, they tend to use their network. And companies that want to give funding are using their network. And their network is a good old boys club. Oh, my cousin's brother just started a company. Can you give him some money for it? Or going, and that is part of the unconscious. So companies who want to have to be proactive about finding brown and black owned female run businesses. And how do you think the tech industry has changed regarding the IB since you joined? I don't think it's changed very much. I think people say that it's changed, but the look of C-suite boards, the look of startups is not rapidly changing. People will say that it is, but it doesn't look like it. And looking back on your own career, what one thing would you have changed in your working environment to break the bias? I probably would have stopped using the I'm not technical spiel a long time ago. I think that if you're open to learning more early, I would have moved much faster. And looking forward, what actions will you take as a leader to reduce bias and improve the IP for the next generation in tech? Getting in rooms and bringing up the people that I know that are doing the thing. Let's move on to another hot topic in business today, which is work-life balance and mental health. Nikki, you are down to me. Have a busy lifestyle. How do you take care of yourself to maintain good mental health? For me, it's gym. I have two small kids. After I get them dropped off in the morning, the first thing I do is head to the gym at least four to five days a week. Have you ever experienced burnout? I don't think so. And I'll use that only because I have a really good village who is really adamant that I take time to avoid it. So. If I'm even close, my dad and my husband are actually both really good about, what did you do for yourself today? What is your advice on how companies can create a more mentally healthy workplace in the new now? I think it's offering meeting-free days. Sitting on meetings all day can get mentally taxing. EAP program, and then having specific sessions at your company around mental health taking breaks, offering like gym or workout stipends. I think those are really good ways to promote mentally health and physical health in the workplace. What would you say motivates you every day to get out of bed? My kids, I have two of them. They are four and one, and they are absolutely my motivation every day. Let us now wrap up with a few words of wisdom and a piece of advice for our listeners. Nikki? What would you say is the best piece of advice you've ever been given that has helped you during setbacks in your role and career? That nobody ever gets it right every day. That's the big one. And then what's the worst advice you ever received in your career and how did you handle it? 
The worst advice I've ever received in my career, a boss was yelling at me. And one of the EAs was like, you just got to take it. And I was like, nobody's yelling at me. My dad didn't yell at me. So there's not going to be any other man ever yelling at me. And so I did let him know, hey, I get that you're upset, but let's not raise our voices at adults. And it worked. I probably shouldn't have said it like that because he was a C-suite executive, but he listened. He never yelled again. And I still had a job. Well done. Amazing. And is there something you wish you would have known or a skill you wish you had when starting out in the tech industry? I wish that I would have known tech industry is really broad. Most people only think like engineering, but there are so many other areas that don't require coding or software development skills. And I wish more people knew that. And if you had the ability to go back in time to when you were just the beginning of your career, what advice would you give to your younger self? It would be keep doing the things. Always try something new. If you're asked to like experiment with something career-wise, try it. You can always say you hate it later. And what advice will you give to young girls, women, women of color, non-binary and transgenders who are trying to break into STEM fields today, especially wanting to become next generation leaders or founders? Get you a mentor who is a woman or non-binary person or transgender person who's already a leader because they know the doors to knock on, but they become your voice in those rooms. Nikki, last but not least, what is next for you in your role and the career intake? What are your career aspirations? What's next for me? I'm still figuring that out. I know what I want to do, which is eventually I want to head a learning and development team at a tech company from all the way from strategy to execution. And I really want a team of people up under me. And so that is my ultimate goal is chief learning officer. Can't wait to follow your journey. And I can definitely see you as an inspirational speaker. <laughs> Thank you so I'm much. The first, on the first road. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you very much, Nikki, for being a guest on the Queens of Tech podcast, sharing your journey with, without a doubt, inspired change, and reshape company culture for the next generation of women, women of color, non-binary, and transgender leaders and founders in tech. Thank you for listening. For more podcast episodes and to learn more about the Queens of Tech initiative and to support us, visit queensof.tech.